I will now hand it over to Gino and mute myself. Yeah, enjoy. Thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, for those of you, you probably all know who David is, but for those of you that don't, uh, David is from Guadalajara, originally moved to Philly a long time ago, opened Tequila's Restaurant, still there today, and created Samba Spirits 17, 15 years ago. David? 16, uh, almost 16. 17, yes. Um, and that has expanded as his import polio has expanded. So Siembra Vice, Siembra Azul, imports Don Mateo de la Sierra from Emilio Vareja, works with Pedro Jimenez, imports Mazonte, uh, founded the Bat Project with Rodrigo Medellin. The list goes on and on. Um, but uh, he wanted to talk about Siembra Vice and Sestrel today. So we're going to dive into that product a little bit more. And uh, I'll just let him take it away. And please throw in your questions in the Q&A. Um, we can answer as much as we can. And Dave's got a bunch of great photos and, and video to share with us. Thank you, David, for joining us and sharing. No, uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to a lot of people all over the world uh, wearing my pajamas, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, I was uh, fascinated to see, look back and uh, see the, uh, how agave spirits categories are being evolving and uh, the, um, the level uh, of attention and, and respect that they're developing in the last uh, 20 years, 15 years. So, you know, when I, when I walk in into this category, uh, I was a very young guy from Guadalajara who was, uh, who was very lucky to be in the epicenter of agave spirits. Uh, and uh, being from Guadalajara, it's no way that you can hide from the culture uh, or detach from the culture of, of tequila. Uh, so at the age of uh, 17, I remember uh, a group of uh, older friends uh, you know, they just have the idea to go and visit a distillery in Arenal, which is only about 35 minutes from Guadalajara, and uh, take a look of the, uh, you know, the, the process of how tequila is made. And uh, that distillery happens to be uh, Cascawin, which uh, I'm being very lucky, and I will talk a little bit more about that distillery in a few minutes. But uh, you know, my, my, my official journey uh, and, and my, my first approach to tequila was uh, at the age of 17, I'm 58 right now, so you make the math. Uh, and uh, at the age of 22, uh, I migrated to the United States. Uh, and uh, at the age of 23, uh, I opened uh, a little restaurant in downtown Philadelphia which was the city to adopt me uh, back in the 80s. And um, as, as Gina mentioned, that restaurant has been operating since then. Uh, we just, we are about to turn 34 years of age. That for uh, restaurant age, it make us an ancestral restaurant, you know. And um, the, uh, the name that I choose for the restaurant you know, as uh, being a tapatio, which is, you know, that's the name that is used to identify people from Guadalajara. It was something that I reflect and to really represent um, who I am, you know, culturally speaking, you know, my roots, where they are, where, where they coming from. And I found very appropriate to call the restaurant Tequila's Restaurant. And, um, uh, we work around that name and we developed this logo that it was tequilas highlighting the word tequilas. And um, it was, you know, soon after we opened, we figured out that it was uh, um, kind of like a challenge name for a restaurant back in the, in the 80s and in the northeast of the United States. You know, I mean, the uh, Texas, California, uh, New Mexico, the border states, they were a little bit more familiar uh, with uh, the Mexican culture, but in the Northeast, it was pretty much the beginning of this, you know, attention, the people was given attention to, to, to the Mexican 
culinary culture and tequila. So, you know, the name tequila became a big challenge for the restaurant. And uh, thanks to that and thanks to that challenge, instead of walk away and look for an alternative names, I decided to uh, focus even more, not just in our food, but also in the, uh, in the name of the restaurant and what it represents. You know, it's a worth, tequila is a word loaded with culture and history. So I decided to, to, to focus uh, in, into not just promoting the gastronomical culture of Mexico, but also in the uh, spirits of Mexico. So it's been an incredible journey because uh, back then uh, it was uh, almost uh, a fun topic, you know, something that people were making fun when you mentioned the word tequila. Immediately people started to talk about worms and big sombreros and cactus and we Mexicans taking a siesta on the desert and uh, all these things. So for me, it became a great incentive and um, I start to even get deeper into the culture of tequila and look for uh, information, for studies, for anything related to tequila. And uh, I start to uh, get in touch with what they became my mentors uh, of tequila. You know, uh, historians, uh, anthropologists, sociologists, and obviously producers. So that was the beginning and the foundation for Siembra Spirits. You know, Siembra Spirits was pretty much a project that was uh, motivated to exist by uh, continue to learn and to uh, dig deeper into the culture and the mystical aspects of tequila and mezcal and all the spirits of Mexico. So back in the uh, early 2000s, we started to work in a project that it was uh, aiming to create uh, an expression of tequila that uh, you can connect us to the uh, terroir of agave spirits and specifically on tequila. Uh, we want to bring to the people, you know, and to uh, uh, show the people the incredible complexity of this uh, spirit made out of agave. So uh, we uh, approached two different producers. I went to the Highlands region uh, and uh, Arandas to be specific. And I met the uh, Vivanco family and um, we start to develop an expression of tequila that it was truly uh, uh, an, an, an expression, a true expression of the terroir from the Highlands region. That, uh, you know, as, as you may know, the denomination of origin of tequila, uh, even if embraced five states of Mexico, but about the majority of the tequila is produced in one state, which is Jalisco about 95% of the total liters of tequila and agave comes from the state of Jalisco. And that region has it's been, uh, it's divided in two main regions, uh, the highlands and the lowlands or valles. So we start with the highlands, uh, we develop Siembra Azul, and, uh, which is part of the portfolio that uh, Winebo uh, offers. And uh, it's a tequila that is produced with uh, agaves that are uh, grow and harvest in the Arandas region, which uh, is a very expressive agave from that region due to the uh, soil and weather conditions of, the, of that part of the denomination of origin. Uh, very high elevations to create a dry and cool uh, climate that uh, allows the metabolisms of the agave to slow down and therefore live longer and therefore they are able to develop more natural sugar uh, and you know they develop a very unique uh, flavor profiles. So you know the Siembra Azul that was a project that allowed us to introduce our ideas uh, our experiences into uh, the most important market in the world for agave spirits, which is United States. So, you know, I really want to have that uh, tool that allowed me to go and knock the doors, not just in the restaurant, you know, or in Philadelphia, but to start to go 
across the United States and uh, show, you know, from our perspective, the beauty of tequila. Um, back uh, then, we continued to develop the project. We uh, expand to the uh, Valles region. And uh, obviously, uh, Cascawin being the distillery that it has uh, a very special part of uh, a role of why I'm getting to tequila. I was the first uh, distillery that I uh, went to um, ask if they were, if we were allowed to uh, develop an expression of tequila that uh, as the Highlands, as the Siembra Azul, to represent the Highlands culture, flavors, uh, terroir. Now we want to do it in the Valles, on the Lowlands region. And uh, Salvador Rosales Sr. and Salvador Rosales uh, Jr., they were kind enough to consider the project and to agree to welcome us into their home, their distillery, and uh, start to develop what it came, the Siembra Valles project. Um, and um, after start to work with them and see the flexibility and the openness to the suggestions that I have for a specific uh, parts of production, you know, typically a distillery when you don't own the distillery and when you work with a distillery to produce something that is not going to have their own name, we call maquilas, uh, you know, they, they give you to choose their products and uh, you taste and you decide which flavor profile you're going, to, uh, you're going to select and you're going to put in your bottle and then you uh, export or, you know, commercialize that product. In the case of Siembra, we're very specific, we're very picky. We like to get very involved in flavor profiles and production and we... Yeah, we get very, very into it. And they were very open, you know, the, the Rosales family, they were very, very open and very flexible. So uh, I realized that uh, I, can, uh, off, I can ask them to do something that I, it was a dream for me. It was a project that I have for years, for two decades to be uh, uh, more precise. Uh, I want to develop an expression of tequila that truly uh, represent the uh, original flavors of what we know as vino mezcal from tequila, which is the pre-industrialization process of making tequila. When the, uh, before the arrival of, of this high efficient technology and highly productive and efficient uh, methods of production, I always want to taste the terroir uh, without being disturbed by technology. So when I present to the Rosales family the idea, uh, they immediately agree and, and they support this idea, this crazy idea to go back to something that nobody in the tequila category has been done for more than a hundred years. So, you know, uh, finally, I was uh, already. David, there, there wasn't any pushback from Sal Salvador Rosales Senior. Well, you know, the only pushback was like, okay, David, yes, that sounds beautiful, but how are we gonna do it? You know, there's absolutely nobody in this in the within the deal of tequila uh, producing tequila that it knows. Uh, how to produce with the, uh, the way that you want to produce with the true ancestral methods of production. So that was the first thing that they say. And obviously, I mean, I don't blame them. They said, you know, they said, it sounds very good, very romantic, very cool, but how are we going to make this happen? So the answer to that was, uh, I'll be right back. Let me talk to <laughs> a great friend of mine that is next door to Jalisco that produced uh, mezcal uh, in Michoacán. And uh, due to the uh, geographic proximity to Jalisco and the, the, the historical uh, relationship between Jalisco and Michoacán and distillation, uh, Emilio Vieira and his father, Don Emilio Vieira, 
they produce, uh, they distill with techniques that were very similar to the techniques used in Jalisco uh, pre-industrialization. So I went to Michoacán and, uh, you know, because part of our project also embraced mezcal that is produced by the Vieira family, which is an amazing expression of mezcal. And also another guy that is very open, very generous with his knowledge. Uh, and I say, you know, hey guys, do you mind to share your knowledge with uh, tequileros in Jalisco? Uh, we had to put this on a context, in a cultural context, that that question was a very complicated question to ask to a, a tequila, a mezcal producer, because traditionally the tequileros and the mezcaleros, they don't talk to each other. There is a, it's a big gap, cultural gap and pride and all these things uh, uh, that um, maintain these two uh, categories uh, separate. Uh, they both are very critical to each other. So for me to ask uh, to a mezcalero to open the door to a tequilero, it, it, I know and I knew there was a big challenge. But the answer of Emilio and his father and his mother, which is also a maestra mezcalera, uh, Doña Delia, uh, they, they were like, sure, why not bring them? And I will, we would love to meet them. So now I have to go back to the tequileros and ask them if they were willing to uh, go to a binata, a distillery, to produce mezcal <laughs> and uh, uh, learn how to uh, just distill with uh, methods of production that they were used centuries ago in the tequila category. So. It, it was just beautiful. And uh, one of the first um, goals of the project were, were accomplished when they both families agreed to meet and to work together. Uh, for me, that was uh, one of the biggest uh, accomplishments of this project to get together the Agave Spirits family again. You know, uh, not having this uh, divisions created by geopolitically and marketed and, and nonsense uh, reasons and reunite the Agave Spirits family. So Emilio Vieira brought his team to Jalisco and uh, we start to develop uh, the, uh, probably is gonna be here, uh, let me see, yeah, look at this. This is a, uh, uh, the, on the left side, you're gonna see, this is the vinata using Filipino distills. And uh, uh, they use obviously underground pits to cook their agave. And on the right side, uh, you see cascawin, you know, with the traditional brick ovens. And uh, so, you know, to, to get these two families working in a tequila distillery, it was uh, beyond my, and, understanding how that was possible, you know, but there is Emilio, his team directing, you know, the develop of the, uh, um, of the area, you know, the, where we're going to have ancestral produce, digging the hole in the ground, you know, he ordered the Filipino distill for us, you know, we use the maestro that uh, makes his distills for him, uh, and uh, it was just an incredible, uh, accomplishment by these two families to be able to work together and to come up with the spirit that it truly represents the uh, ancestral flavors of tequila. Yeah. And I'm going to go through the process, but I probably it's going to be loud. So uh, I'm going to take the sound in a second. <laughs> Sorry guys, but you can hear the sound of the distillery. This is a, you know, this is a, this is a pit being loaded inside Cascawin. Uh, it didn't take place this type of, uh, uh, this type of uh, technique of roasting agave. It didn't happen on the tequila category for over a hundred years. 
you know, the more traditional production of tequila nowadays is being uh, roasting the agaves in brick ovens. Uh, but the roasting in the pit, that is really, really old. So, you know, the Siembra Valles Ancestral, that was one of the things that we want to do. We want to be as closest to the ancestor, as an ancestral process of roasting uh, the agaves to make that conversion of the starches into fermentable sugars using a pit that is going to take us, uh, it take us five days to complete that process. Uh, one of the big uh, reasons, uh, one of the main reasons why tequila uh, start to shift into the roasting and peats is to save time. You know, the category uh, in the uh, early 1900s start to became very popular. It, it became uh, a lot of demand for production of tequila. So we had to find ways to make us more efficient. So one of the first changes was this, you know, to instead of wait for five days at lower temperature, they came up with a bright idea to use steam uh, and brick ovens. So you can control the temperature, you can uh, accelerate the process, and instead of wait five days, they were able to bring down to only three days. Back in those years, that was a huge advance, you know, in, in production. Uh, so, you know, that was the, uh, uh, that was one of the big, 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 big changes between tequila and mezcal. And you know, you know, what is the big difference between tequila and mezcal? Was that pitiness, that smokiness that we taste on mezcales. In tequila, you don't have that because this method of roasting is not used anymore. Uh, and if you have, if you taste the Siembra Valles Ancestral, it's going to be a lot of reminiscence of the pitiness that is going to be a reflection of this uh, part of the process. Uh, any questions uh, coming? I mean, anything? Hey, David, I, I thought I saw that Chava is on here, so I thought we'd, we'd introduce him ah. really fast. Salvador Maybe Rosales. We, we, we have to unmute him though, I think. I don't know, he doesn't have his, his video on. He said he only has a few minutes more, but I just thought if we had the time, we could oh. say hi. So, so Salvador Chava is, uh, well, David, would you introduce him? Uh, well, you know, Chava is, uh, for me, you know, our slogan for Siembra Spirits is the future of tradition. And I think that uh, if I can use in the most comfortable way that slogan, the future of tradition, Chava Rosales is, there exactly he is what it is. There we go. Hey, Chava, uh, good to see you. Hola, one of the reasons that I still maintain faith yeah. in the category of tequila is because this guy that just came to the conversation, Chava Rosales. Yeah. Hola, hola, saludos a todos. <laughs> ¿Cómo están? So, uh, Chava. So no, Chava okay. Is is uh, Chava's family, is his father and brother and what your sister as well? They're all involved in all the decisions, and everything that David does to work with them, and some of the amazing things like this project alone wouldn't have happened without them taking part of the distillery and building, you know, digging out a pit, you know, devoting space and time to these projects. Uh, and, and the many more, the, the way Cascaween is evolving with, with the new anniversario that just came out, wouldn't be possible. Uh, the Tahona that David and Chava were able to have installed at the distillery, right? Um, so that, that type of, of, of mashing production as well um, is all very cool and, and, and thank you. Thanks for joining us, Chava. If any of you guys have questions for him real quick, since he's just Sorry, here for a minute. Sorry, but my English is very, very, very bad. But uh, uh, thank you for everything. Thank you for your support. Uh, and be safe because it's these difficult days, no? <laughs> you make it less difficult, Chava, by giving us the spirit of Jalisco, you know. ¿Quieres decir algo, Chava? Si quieres, puedo hacer el intento de traducirlo de la manera. No, David, no, no, no. Yo estaba acá de viendo un poco el video, más bien eh, continúen, un, un gusto saludar a todos y, y un placer, ¿no? Como siempre verlos y bueno, 
eh, no, sigue dando, ahora sí, tus buenas lecciones, como siempre lo haces. Ok. Oh, he has to leave, but uh, uh, he's going to keep in the eye on us. If you have any questions for him, please uh, submit the questions and, uh, and, and he can uh, respond. Yeah. Pero gracias, Chava. Uh, it's, uh, no, y perdón, o sea, nada más me conecté porque Gino me pidió que saludara. Pero de verdad, no puedo quedarme más tiempo en la conversación. Sigan disfrutando y cuídense mucho. Un abrazo y gracias por todo. Gracias, Chava. Gracias, Chava. Ok. Bye. -bye. Ok. So, um, if anybody has questions on the, uh, on the uh, roasting part of the process, uh, you know, this, uh, again, if we put this in a, in a historical and cultural uh, and technical context, this is, this is a big, big deal for tequila. You know, uh, I tell you, this is two decades for me to come to where we are right now with Siembra Valles Ancestral. And uh, it's because whenever I present this idea to a tequilero, they really look at me like if I was a goofy, crazy, you know, guy who don't know what to talk about. You know, but I, I looking at what is happening in the world of agave spirits and the recognition uh, for agave spirits and its flavors, uh, we all know, I mean, I, we have a pretty savvy audience. Uh, we all know that the agave as a raw material offered to us an endless organoleptic elements and uh, they're less uh, they suffer this raw material in the, uh, uh, with industrialization, with efficiency the more present those elements are gonna be available for us and our palates. So that's why I was very confident that this project can really you know, highlight uh, the cultural, historical, and also organoleptic uh, aspects of this uh, category, the tequila category, yeah, okay. David, we have a question that I think is a good one for right now. And have you seen like any other brands really adopt this ancestral, um, per, these ancestral production methods? I know that a lot of branding has moved towards that, but like in the truest sense of it, have you seen that or has anyone else? Uh, as far as I know, it's been uh, three producers um, that I, uh, I, I believe they approach in more from a marketing perspective and, and, and kind of like a, yeah, you know, mezcal is being generating so much attention and respect on the agave spirits consumption. So this, uh, even two big brands that uh, they decide to come up with, you know, this uh, smoky tequila, but uh, no, and I'm really looking forward to have another producers to became uh, truly generally uh, committed to methods who are not just for a marketing or a gimmicky uh, reasons, mm -hmm. but uh, to have people who are just like the Rosales and, and Emilia and the Vieiras decide to work together. I would like to see other producers to follow this. And I, I highly recommend it to the producers, if it's any producer listen to us right now. Uh, I mean, to revisit and to uh, tasting what our ancestors and what uh, tequila used to be. It's not like it's better than, 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 than all the, the, the rest of the tequilas or worse. It's just another way to showcase the diversity that this category can offer to us. You know, this is a, a category that is so, uh, it's so easy to fell into the endless uh, expressions of the raw material. Uh, and, and, you know, some people, it's not gonna like the, the smokiness that you find in these methods of production, uh, but they may gonna find that other elements in the same production that is gonna allow us to, they're gonna allow them to produce, to, to taste flavors that they were hidden or lost by the uh, use of the 
um, uh, brick ovens or, or the uh, autoclaves or diffusers. Uh, so this is just a proposition that is there for the category to continue to express, to be more expressive, uh, you know, in all yeah, the we, meaning of the word, yeah. We also have a, another good question from Kelvin. Uh, Kelvin, do you, want to, do you want to ask? I have unmuted you. To get oh, snap. Uh, I'm going live? Yeah, you're going live. Okay. Well, David, um, I wanted to ask a question about um, the roast thing. So, did you, working with Emilio, who strictly, well, not strictly, mainly works with endemic agaves of Michoacan, mm -hmm. like Cubriata, Inakidens, were there any adjustments you guys had to make in your roasting for a Blue Weber? Um, were there any differences due to the sugar levels of Blue Weber? Uh, big time, big time. Uh, I have to, I have to uh, just make one uh, interesting observation. Emilio works with Agave Tequilana Weber sometimes. Remember, Michoacan is within the denomination of origin of, uh, uh, of tequila and vice versa. So uh, mainly Emilio works with Cupriatas and Inequidens uh, and Cenizos, which are the uh, the endemic agaves uh, from, from that region, but also agave tequilana Weber. But, uh, you know, we are right now in our batch number eight of Siembra Valles Ancestral. And uh, I wanna tell you that uh, batch one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and I'm pretty sure when we get to batch 20, is a process of learning, you know, it's been, uh, one of the other very beautiful aspects of this project is to rediscover, re-exploring, you know, how agave tequilana weber, how the uh, roasting, how the head maceration, which is the next step. Uh, and again, I have to, let me just, excuse me for a second. I'm gonna try to, And why is that good silent? Well, it's going to happen in one second by itself. <laughs> Give me one second. Right, there we go. Ah. Can you tell how non savvy I am for these things. But, uh, uh, so, you know, the, the uh, dealing with uh, agave tequilana wherever and using these methods of production is being uh, a learning curve for everybody. Uh, even for Emilio, you know, it's like he come and he used a pit that is uh, not even half of the size of the pit that he normally used. Uh, and then we had the, 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 the terroir, uh, the temp you know, look at the, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very, very, very interesting uh, aspects of uh, every step of the process. Uh, we were pretty much, Emilio put there his knowledge and we basically start to, from zero to experiment it. I mean, there were uh, uh, incredible challenges when it comes to uh, present this to the Regulatory Council of Tequila because the Regulatory Council of Tequila has been in operations only for 20 plus years. And the regulations, the, the regulations of tequila as we know them, they've been in place only for about 30 years. Uh, here we're using uh, methods of production that are centuries old. So you can imagine when the uh, Regulatory Council of Tequila came to the distillery, to the facility, and look at these methods of production. I mean, they were scratching their heads and tried to figure out what was going on. And we comply. We, we comply with every step of the process of how tequila has to be made uh, within the parameters of the regulations. So, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, to, to answer more specifically your question uh, the, uh, of using tequilana, Weber and Emilio, uh, it was a process to took us not just one batch to really learn uh, how how this is going to be uh, developed as a tequila. Yeah. And uh, 
you know, you just saw the, uh, let me, let me just see if I can go back. Um, uh, I can go this way because it's very interesting. This was another big step for the project. Uh, instead of use the uh, Taonas, which uh, I throw a curveball to the Rosales because they thought that we were going to use the Taonas. You know, I mean, you want an ancestral uh, artisanal tequila. Well, oh, here we go. We're going to need a Taona, right? And uh, I was like, well, mm, nope. Uh, that's some modern stuff, you know. Why not we go to the real ancestral practice? I'm gonna allow the sound. It's only a few, few like a minute. But uh, look at this. This is a hand maceration. Obviously, can you hear me? If I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, these guys, they are uh, macerating. They were not happy at all because. You know, the, the methods of uh, extraction that is used in Cascawin typically are with uh, uh, sugar mills. And the sugar mills, you just basically turn the switch on and off and the mills do their job. Here, just imagine to work uh, hours and carrying these very heavy wood mallets and start to macerate. Uh, but, uh, as, as the project was evolving and as the word was spreading on town in Arenal, they became very proud to be able to use uh, techniques that they were truly connected with their ancestors of these guys' great-grandparents. Uh, and, you know, 200 years. They were there uh, 200 years ago. This uh, process was used. So, uh, they were, they became very, uh, very proud of being linked to a process to make their great grandparents proud. And uh, they were finally uh, revisiting something that was truly uh, belonged to their culture, to the Arenal and Amatitan and Tequila culture. You know, there was not just another tequila, but there was also an expression of tequila. They were linking them to their ancestors, which is just beautiful. You know, uh, uh, every time that I go to the distillery now, they are always asking me, when are we going to do the next batch of Siembra Valles Ancestral? Uh, but that first visit, especially this, the, the one that you just saw in the, in the video, they were not a happy bunch. They were very, very, very upset with me. But, um, you know, so, so this was a, a method of uh, extraction that also revisited the historical methods of production. This is pre-Taona uh, extraction. And, uh, you know, this the fermentation part is very interesting because uh, uh, Cascawin is one of the few distilleries that is still used on the upper left side, you see the picture of these uh, uh, fermentation tanks. They're made out of uh, brick and covered with uh, fiberglass, which is uh, an old, uh, tra the transition between wood and stainless steel for the tequila category. It went through a, a period of time where from the wood fermentation, they went to these pilas de fermentación, pilas meaning, you know, uh, the containers uh, made out of brick. Uh, so cascawin is still used for some of their expressions, uh, this uh, fermentation style. Uh, all the Siembra Valles products that we produce in cascawin go through the fermentation on the brick uh, tanks. Uh, but for ancestral, obviously, you know, trying to maintain the ancestral practices, we use that uh, beautiful uh, wood uh, vessel that is on the black and white picture. Uh, that's where fermentation takes place for ancestral. Uh, that was uh, a really very interesting, uh, talking about learning and the learning curve. In the first batch, the first two or three batches, we use, we induce uh, yeast uh, because we don't know what was going to happen. 
but from batch four, five, six, and seven, it's been uh, natural fermentations. Uh, and um, it's been, you know, obviously, you know, needless to say, it's a whole different a range of flavors when we don't use any, when we don't induce any uh, yeast. So uh, part of the project is to learn how our, you know, cocktion, extraction, fermentations, and distillation going to react to these methods. Yeah. So any Dave, there was, yeah. there was a question that someone sent me beforehand, and they were asking about the bagasse. And yeah, yeah. Uh, which I guess is, is kind of tied into introducing yeast or not, because with other expressions with Siembra Azul and Siembra Vias, you, you, you do introduce yeast to it, but you, um, and you also use the bagasse, correct? Correct. That was one of the first clues, the uh, signs that I get from the Rosales, that I, were, I was in a very open mind distillery. Uh, because uh, I, I always want to bring uh, bagasse into fermentation. Uh, I mean, the reason that the tequila category in general, uh, most of tequilas now, when I say most, it's almost 100% on the few producers who still use the bagasse in fermentation, is because as you can imagine, I mean, look at these fermentation tanks uh, that we have on the upper left side. To fill those uh, tanks of, uh, uh, with bagasse is a lot of work. You have to do it by hand. There is no other way that you can bring bagasse into fermentation but to lift it by hand and bring it into fermentation. And uh, no matter how efficient or non-efficient methods of extraction you have for the juices of agave after you cook the, the, plant, the agaves, you're going to leave a lot of sugars attached to that fiber, to that bagasso. Uh, and uh, we sacrifice those sugars on the name of efficiency on, our, on the category of tequila. Uh, uh, if you use a taona, you leave more than 20% of sugars attached to the bagasse. If you use sugar meals, which is more efficient, you leave uh, about, you know, 15% of sugars attached to the bagasse. All that go to waste. And when we leave, throw that into waste, we throw in 20%, 25%, 15% of flavors. And also the chemical reactions during fermentation, adding that fiber into the microorganisms that they are developed, the complex uh, uh, flavor profiles, it's going to have a drastic effect. So the Rosales family, they, they graciously agree to take that extra uh, you know, labor and uh, bring uh, the bagasse into all the expressions of Siembra Valles. And they use it now for their plata, for their aniversarios. You know, they're using a bagasse also in fermentation. So that is a, that's a, it's a, it's a good practice. I mean, all the mezcaleros that we know, they produce good mezcales, they always gonna bring the bagasse into fermentation and distillation. So here in batch number five, six, uh, no, six, seven, five, six and seven and eight, we uh, bring the bagasse from fermentation into distillation. Uh, the Rosales, they just came with this, uh, an incredible tequila expression they call uh, uh, the Aniversario, which was honoring the um, uh, past of uh, Salvador Rosales uh, Sr., uh, the father of Salvador Rosales, uh, how you call is Salvador Rosales Sr., Salvador Rosales Jr., and Salvador, Salvador Rosales III, this Chava. Gino, help me with this one. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So, you know, they came up with this expression of aniversario that they use um, a bagasse in, in distillation also. So, you know, the use of bagasse is just to enhance even more, to bring flavors they are still attached to our raw material into the process. So that's the reason that we use bagasse into uh, our fermentations of uh, Siembra, Siembra Valles and some of the Cascawin expressions too. 
Hey, David, on, on ultra nerd note, is there a reason they chose like the brick and laid in the ground to mash upon versus like doing it in a hollowed out tree trunk or um, with like, you know, sledgehammers or wooden bats as well? Just the concrete with the brick and laid. Well, there are stones. Uh, you know, this original, if you see, it's a circular uh, area where they do the maceration. Uh, when, when the Rosales were preparing this area that we assigned for Siembra Valles Ancestral, they were designing for a small taona. It was going to be there. <laughs> so then the, tiny you know, stone. the news came out that uh, it's going to be uh, hand maceration. So okay. it's a better grip. Uh, when you were macerating in uh, these uh, very pointy and sharp stones with the wood mallets, it makes even more efficient the maceration process. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, you can tell you've been there quite a few times. You notice those things. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. So next, next part of the process, there was also another crazy part of the process. That was distillation. So, you know, this is, this is insane to bring back the uh, Filipino distills into a tequila distillery. Uh, that's, that don't happen also in centuries. So this is a distill uh, made out of uh, pine wood. That is, uh, if you see, we have a copper base where we put the mosto, the most. And then it goes into distillation. This, this distill, this particular distill is connected to a, a condensation. You know, this is not a good picture because it's covered by the mango tree. But it's a condensation uh, tank where from, from the uh, wood distill goes into condensation. But uh, we have another distill. We are about to install a second distill a, a Filipino distill, so we can do an internal condensation on the second distill, uh, which is going to be a lot of fun, you know, just to, to do, to add that part of the process to make it even more ancestral, the process. Um, uh, I, I, if we continue to do these things, probably we're going to go back to a clay uh, distillation. Uh, if Chavez listened to me, probably he's not going to talk to me again, but uh, uh, that, that would be amazed to to bring clay distillation into into this uh, into Cascawin. David, do you have a photo of the stills from Don Mateo from Amelia's place to show the the contrast, just or uh, the similarities? I should say more or less. Uh, sure. Yeah, it's on the first picture here. Uh, just to remind everybody, because that's what Emilio helped. Right, Amelia helped uh, yep. with this yeah. whole process. I mean, the, 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 the stills they were they were produced by uh, they were made out of uh, in Michoacan uh, by uh, craftsmen that uh, specialize in this this type of uh, carpentry. Uh, there we go. So Emilio used two different type of woods. Uh, use uh, oyamel, which is uh, another uh, piney sappy. Uh, wood that is uh, endemic of Michoacan. There are the trees who attract the monarch butterflies. You know, the every winter migration from the butterflies, from the monarchs, they go and mate only on these uh, high elevations of the state of Michoacan where these type of trees grow. That's the only part of Mexico where you find oyamels. Uh, it's Michoacan, uh, the southern part of Michoacan, in the high elevations of the state, the very, very high elevations, and also in the northern part of the state of Mexico, the boundaries with Michoacan. Uh, so Emilio used the oyamel wood and uh, also the pine wood that is also endemic from Michoacan. And we have pine in Jalisco, you know, there's uh, pine and oak. It's also uh, widely found in the state of Jalisco. So the, um, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the uh, picture of the Vinata uh, uh, on the left side. Um, that's Oliverio on the picture. It's an amazing guy who is uh, Emilio's right hand man who has uh, it's an encyclopedia on knowledge when it comes to 
any part of the process of mezcal production. If you go to the agave fields with him, uh, it will give you uh, always a different perspective of uh, what, what you see on these ecosystems. Uh, if you come to the Vinata, uh, remember that's how they call in Michoacán the distilleries, they call Vinatas. In other parts of Jalisco, they call them tabernas, but in Michoacán is Vinata. So the Vinata in Michoacán and Oliverio, sitting with Oliverio, Oliverio in the middle of the night, and sipping mezcal that is coming out of these distills uh, is uh, what I imagine the transition from earth to heaven, you know. Uh, I think uh, uh, Gino published uh, this uh, afternoon a picture of us drinking mezcal at 7 a.m. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, when we spend nights in Divinata, uh, and uh, when we are cook, when we are waiting for the agave, the the pit to be ready to be, uh, be loaded with agaves, which is a process to take overnight. And sipping agave with Oliverio and that vinata and with Emilio is is and, uh, one of those uh, incredible experiences on the agave spirits world. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, David. I was just trying to. Uh... Just compare, compare so we can see it. Yeah. The, the copper pot is much deeper for this it number is. of bias you know, anniversario. Yeah, versus, the, production, uh, the production Emilio has is larger. You know, we have a very small uh, capacity of production. We, we produce, uh, you know, our pit, just to give you an idea, Emilio's pit uh, has a capacity for uh, 14 tons of agave. Our pit, uh, the pit in uh, Cascawing has only four ton capacity. So it's a uh, substantially, you know, difference between the, the, the uh, capabilities of production. And that, uh, you know, the last part of the process for Ancestral, which is also very important, and uh, I make a lot of emphasis on this, it was the uh, stabilization process. You know, uh, as a lot of the mezcaleros, uh, they, they led their mezcales to stabilize, to repose, to uh, evolve in, uh, for months. Uh, that was also something that uh, I, I really, really uh, emphasize on the process of ancestral. This was another clue that I get from uh, the Rosales when I proposed the ancestral project because I also asked them if it was possible to uh, uh, put in these uh, glass containers and these demijohns in garrafones, if we can rest the uh, Siembra Valles uh, high proof. You know, that's uh, one of the expressions of tequila that uh, is on the, in the portfolio. Uh, we have the Siembra Valles Blanco high proof, which is an expression of tequila where we, the steel we cut at uh, you know around 49 percent, and uh, instead of adding water, we bring that tequila after the second distillation into glass, and we let it rest for months. And if you notice, the cup is a corn, so we allow some micro oxygenation to go through. And uh, the most stringent alcohols, which are the more volatile alcohols, they're going to evaporate through this time. And it's gonna make these expressions of agave spirit on the Siembra Valles uh, high proof and the Siembra Valles ancestral a lot more approachable. You know, so that's one of the reasons that we uh, incorporate this part of the process. So when, when the Rosales give me the green light to do the uh, stabilization with the Valles high proof, I knew that my possibilities to do ancestral, they were getting even closer, you know, yeah. So it was the two. David, I also want to bring up just like this aging in glass that we, we see, we're seeing is, is very expensive. The it glass is. is expensive to acquire. Well, and the it, longer it sits in glass, the more time everyone's just sitting on money that yeah. they could be making. So the whole process takes not only time, but again, time and money and, and flavor all these things are intertwined and well, we just it, see all that are. glass sitting there, but it, it's, it's, not, it's not something that just everyone can do. 
well, everybody can do it if you want it. If but, they have the, the money. But, uh, but here is where you really come out to the big question that uh, how much of, uh, uh, what is the main incentive that you have? When you want to do something uh, traditionally, but traditionally not from a marketing perspective, but from the cultural perspective. Remember, what we want to do is to revisit flavors. We, we want to explore what was going on centuries ago. And uh, the, the economical aspect, it has to be put aside because uh, it's, 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 it's just not efficient at all. Just to give you an idea, to produce uh, one of the beautiful tequilas that Cascawin produce, uh, you average about uh, eight to 10 kilos of uh, agave per liter. When we produce Ancestral, you go up to 15, 17 kilos of agave uh, to produce one liter of Ancestral. Uh, because here we're not looking about efficiency. We're looking about flavors. So the less you sacrifice or you compromise uh, with technology, the more rewards you're going to get on the organoleptic side. Yeah. So. You know, and here is another big part of our project. Uh, I've been always a big fan of traceability and transparency. Uh, this is this uh, back label that is on the right side. It's a typical from our mezcaleros. You know, the mezcaleros, they are proud producers who are showcased their, their knowledge and their, their, their give you all the information that is in their in their products, but the tequileros, and I guess this was something related to efficiency, the increase of efficiency and the decrease of quality, organoleptically speaking, uh, they keep the um, production uh, technical data uh, aside. They, they, not, they not are very generous when it comes to shared uh, methods of uh, uh, of production, and I find that uh, through my thirty plus years uh, wandering in uh, in the tequila category, that the more industrial and the more compromising the products uh, that are made in distilleries, the more secretive they're going to be about showing their methods of production. Uh, so here we are very proud to work with producers who are doing the right thing. You know, the Vivancos are very, uh, they're willing to, 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 to share with, uh, with, with the world what we're doing. The Rosales, they are more than open to, to uh, share the, uh, our methods of production. So every label of uh, Siembra Spirits always going to have 100% traceability and transparency. You know, this is information that it takes you from cultivation, uh, roasting, extraction, fermentation, and distillation. Uh, everything that is in the method, in the process, is going to be open to the public. Uh, we have nothing to hide. To the contrary, we're very proud to present it to you, how we made this uh, beautiful liquid art. Yeah. Hey David, um, there was a question from one of our special, from one of Winebow specialists that I thought was uh, real, really special. Um, Peter, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? <laughs> I almost forgot it. Um, thank <laughs> you. Uh, this is fascinating. Thanks for uh, presenting this. Uh, uh, this is a, a great project. I was just curious um, if you had a reference point. I, I know you're going back and and doing a lot of the physical steps, uh, retracing some of the, the production methods. Mm -hmm. But do you have a reference point for flavor profile? Was there anything written? Are there any records as to what you're trying to achieve in the final product? Um, the only reference that we have, in, uh, and it's the closest, they're not the same, but uh, it will be the Raicilleros and the producers of Agave Spirit within the region in Jalisco. But unfortunately, no, you know, there, we have to remember that uh, uh, tequila and vino mezcal de tequila and mezcal and raicillas and all the spirits, the native 
the original spirits of Mexico, they were not well studied. There were there were there were not many references that you can uh, find about how they were produced, uh, the origins, uh, you know, of of production. So I would love to have access to a, a, a kata that was done, you know, years ago, but. Unfortunately, no, there is not much information. The only reference is uh, tasting spirits they still produce with ancestral practices uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the region. Uh, uh, you know, just to give you an idea of how little we know uh, about uh, agave spirits, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you this book because uh, it's worth it. Uh, this is a book that was uh, published by the uh, Ciatec. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a very technical, very academic, very scientific book uh, on tequila that uh, took me uh, years to decodify. And whenever I opened this book, I, I had to be with a dictionary and with Google and, and you know, because it's, uh, it's so much, it's so technical, but, this is the very interesting part of this book. A lot of the references, the scientific and technical references that they have, these uh, um, academics, they developed this book. They were, they were based on studies made on grape spirits and sugarcane spirits. There was no data available to really continue to study agave spirits. They just came out with this. This is a big challenge for you guys. I just get my hands into this. The, the new edition of the same book uh, by the Ciatec, it's all Spanish guys, but uh, this is a book that uh, if you think, if you see it's thicker, but this is the revised version of the, uh, of the first book by the Ciatec. And now they start to collect some technical uh, scientific data that uh, allow us to uh, start to go into the deeper into the pretty much unknown uh, uh, technical and um, scientific aspects of the agave spirits. Uh, I think, you know, our next generation, they're going to be able to, uh, if we survive Corona, uh, our next generation is going to be the one that is going to start to have more scientific data uh, and, and try to understand the complexity of agaves. But uh, that was a great question, uh, Peter, because there is no references that I know other than producers that are linked to historical methods of production in Jalisco. But I really appreciate that question. That that's that was great. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, since you have the label up, David, Brayden brought up uh, parameters of the the CRT, mm -hmm. and and asked like basically, w what would you like to see changed uh, in that? Well, I would love to see that it became uh, uh, part of the regulations to to. Uh, showcase the information on labels. Uh, I think the consumer uh, has the right to know what he's drinking, you know. I mean, if we have uh, food labels, um, because their food is for human consumption, you know, spirits are for human consumption, we should know more about it. And uh, I think that the level of a, knowledge on the consumer uh, and the demand from the consumer for information is getting there. Um, but it will help the, in many different aspects, the categories, if we know how our raw materials, grain, sugar cane, uh, you know, grape uh, raw materials are processed. Uh, I mean, you know, this is a, it's a very important aspect of anything that we're going to consume. So, you know, the, the CRT is not who regulates that. The CRT, remember, is only an organism that uh, verify and certify regulations. They are pretty much 
introduced to the category by the Mexican government. So this is something that we have to work with it and, and, and push for transparency and traceability. Yeah. Um, Bill, who does uh, a lot of artwork for uh, PM Spirits, brought up the fact that probably there's a lot of pushback from large brands and large multinational companies to not provide that level of transparency on their label. Is that the case? It, yeah, they, they, they've been hiding a lot. I mean, this is uh, hiding information. It became uh, very common, unfortunately. But it's very interesting because as, as advancing technology and science and adulteration, so I cannot use another word, of flavors, um, it, the art is taking place right now, but at the same time is this other current and this other new niche of consumers and more conscious consumers and more demanding consumers. There's like, you know, what are you feeding us with? What, what, what is that, you know, danger stuff that you're doing? And remember, here is not just the flavors where we want to be sure they're protected and they are, you know, respected. Uh, a lot of these methods of productions they are hiding, they have ecological impact, uh, which is also, you know, dangerous. And um, the, the, the use of agaves uh, in, in our previous uh, event today, I was bringing to the attention uh, that uh, the regulations of tequila, and again, it's not the regulatory council of tequila who does this. This is the, a group of international conglomerates that lobby and push the government into develop uh, or to make a lot more ease the uh, regulations of, of, of uh, tequila or mezcal. Uh, there used to be uh, a part of the regulations. It was stipulated on the regulations that we have to wait for the agaves to mature before we can harvest them and introduce them into the process of tequila. That was part of the regulations. But in the uh, revision of these regulations in 2005, it disappeared. Those two words, cabezas maduras, harvest, I mean, uh, uh, mature heads of agave. The elimination of those two words out of the regulation of tequila create this you know, nightmare that we're going through right now, ecologically and economically because the big producers who uh, install these highly efficient methods of extraction of sugars, they don't mind to uh, cut their time and the use of the land on their agave plantations by years and harvesting agaves, they were young agaves, but they use such a high efficiency on extraction of sugars the day assessed what was the most profitable way to accurate, accurate um, uh, sugars. And they decide to harvest, to take that limitation, you know, by lobbying the government, forcing the government to take those two words, agaves, mature agaves. And they start to harvest agaves. Right now, I, I get almost in tears when I saw agave plantations that they are harvest at the age of three years. Uh, three years, you know, the life expectancy of ag agave is usually, you know, from five to eight, nine years, you're gonna reach that perfect maturity. Uh, when you harvest an agave that is only three years of age, you are bringing to the process an agave that has very little sugar content and you also are taking away the clones, the other reproduction of agaves that is done via offshoots. So you eliminated two generations of agaves from the plantations. It's very serious topics that they are hiding by the big industry. Um, you know, and I think we are learning our lesson because the agave shortage that we're going through right now is, uh, is, is as a result of this uh, undiscriminated use of young agaves in the, for the tequila industry. And, and I and think not, too, David, when you say like 
hidden. The hiding is so uh, in, what complex right now that that even putting a nom on a bottle of tequila doesn't ensure that that tequila was even made at that nom. That's correct. Yeah. It was possibly just bottled there. Uh, uh or not bottled there. It was possibly just shipped through it or never even there. It's, yeah. it's bad. It's pretty bad right now. But we don't it, need it, to go too far down that 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 hole. Even if it's uh, diffused tequila, it could be coming from multiple places. Yeah, I mean it's. Uh, but here's where the consumer plays a big role, you know. And um, uh, I mean, uh, I I get extremely frustrated, and uh, you know, when I visit California with you, Gino, you know, that is, uh, I mean. You have producers, they are so ethical and so proud to maintain methods of production that they're gonna bring quality, pride, tradition. And uh, you know, to produce agave spirits in the right way is very costly. And when you go to these uh, programs that they use in uh, uh, agave spirits, and they basically are giving them away. You know, I mean, I always say if you buy a bottle of tequila that is underpriced right now in these times of extremely expensive, a record-breaking uh, cost of uh, of um, agave, um, how that can be possible? You know, how if the agave is costing you thirty pesos, which is about a dollar and eighty cents a kilo how you can sell tequilas for under 17, even $20 per liter. Uh, I mean, efficiency, yes. You're gonna have um, uh, distilleries to have a highly efficiency methods of production. But even that, for me, the numbers just don't match. Uh, having, having tequilas and mezcales on their price uh, it put in jeopardy a lot of things related to agave spirits. You know, that's why, you know, transparency it should be a way to protect and to demand methods of production that are sustainable. You know, uh, and just to protect our beloved spirits. I mean, there is no way that we can say that we love agave spirits if we are willing to reward. Uh, uh, somebody that is giving away a product that it takes so much from the soil and from the culture and the producer to bring it to us. I agree in That's all aspects whole... of our of our consumption right now, and and then many areas of our life. Transparency is I, 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 so you, you know what, needed. That's why I I I, I really focus on in, in, in education because the awareness of these topics. I mean, if people don't know. You know they're not gonna they're not gonna raise their hand. So you know, siembra the siembra spirits and the producers that we work with. I mean, you have Pedro Jimenez uh, last week that uh, uh, share his incredible knowledge. Uh, you know, you have uh, his wife uh, Monica to produce Pajarote, Emilio Vieira, uh, and, and you know all the producers that we work together to bring something as beautiful as they produce, uh, it pretty much every day gets more and more challenged by producers who are you know, doing things, just thinking on the economical aspect and reward. You know? But if we want to protect the legacy and to have these agave spirits and other beautiful spirits uh, in the future, we have to start to do our thing and be more conscious and be more responsible it's not just the producer has to be responsible, but I also think that the, the main responsibility has to be in the consumer. And that's why education for us is a main, main focus. Try to bring as much as elements for the consumer to digest it and make the right decision. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Greg asking about uh, uh, future possibilities of um, being able to reintroduce more variety into the Blue Weber category of, of, of agave spirits. On tequila, probably. You mean yeah, tequila. tequila. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any other alternative. It has to be. I mean, I'm all for, I mean, I feel bad for other agave 
uh, species in Jalisco because we, we will put them in jeopardy. But uh, I think if we can uh, uh, be very well planning uh, to start to plant other agaves, you know, and to allocate them for tequila production, uh, I think it's, it's a great alternative. We had to take the pressure of one species of agave. We cannot have this monocultive agave uh, tequilana weber and give it all, put all the pressure of hundreds of millions of liters that are produced per year. It's just not sustainable. And, and, and you know, uh, we, we see it now. It's, it's just, we need to open up to endemic agaves. Remember the, as I always mentioned, the only reason that we select agave tequilana Weber for the category of tequila is because out of all the species, out of all the endemic species of the denomination of origin, out of all the species, the tequilana Weber is the one who has the shorter cycle of life. That means that you don't have to wait that long in order to obtain a new plant. It's also the agave that has the higher sugar content. So you need less kilo to make more alcohol. And it's the agave to give us more offshoots. So the reason that we push that and we uh, only allow that uh, species is because big producers back in the 70s and the 60s, they figure out that that was the species of agave that makes more economical sense, not the most ecological sense. So I think that uh, if we really mean that we want to get this category to go to the next generation and to continue to be as beautiful and as expressive of terroir as, as it is, we have to open up, but with order, with very well organized, how we can start to expand this, the, the varietals of agave. Remember, whatever we want to do in agave spirits, we have to plan it with years in advance. You know, what's happening today in the mezcal world, in tequila world, it begins, you know, five years, 10 years, 20, 30 years ago, because that's when the agaves were planted. So that's a big challenge. That's one of the biggest challenges for the category of tequila. What we're gonna do about agave tequilana Weber? You know, which takes me to, I don't know if you want me, you guys probably bored already, right? <laughs> yeah, you good? Uh, Go oh, here's a picture of, uh, of the people behind Ancestral. Uh, you know, there is uh, uh, Don Emilio Vieira and the picture on top. Uh, unfortunately, he left us uh, last year. Uh, uh, you see Chava Rosales and his father in the picture there. And uh, uh, this is a gentleman with an incredible level of integrity and knowledge. And, uh, you know, the agave spirits is what it is and is what it is, thanks to people who uh, approach to their craft the way they do. So I really want to show you guys this picture. And um, uh, this is the pit, uh, talking about the big pit, uh, Emilio's uh, pit. Look at that beautiful 14 ton capacity uh, pit that Emilio has in his Vinata. Yeah, but um, do you want me to go and touch a little bit uh, on the uh, the bat friendly guys? Real quick before you do that, there was another question that I think would be a good one to talk about is uh, from Paris asking how and when was there a Filipino influence in the agave industry and and Mexico? I, I'm sorry, how how when what was was the Filipino influence on on the agave industry like when oh that that's happen? colonial and, times that's the colonial times yeah. you know uh, the late 1600s uh, through the 1700s and still alive today mm -hmm. mm. is it just the stills or was there other things uh that you oh, know of? um if you go to the coastal part of uh of colima jalisco uh, they still produce some uh, uh 
they don't distill, but they produce tuba. It's a, it's a fermented beverage. It's made out of the coconut trees. Um, the, but uh, the stills, no. The stills are, are, are there is no distillation uh, other than agave on the Filipino distills, but they were, the Filipinos, they were brought as, uh, as slaves by the Spaniards on the uh, late 1600s. And, you know, they introduced the palm, the coconut trees, the palm trees, and uh, metals of distillation through wood, wood distillation. Yeah. But that's uh, relatively new and is linked to the colonial times. That's not pre-Hispanic. Yeah. Yeah. So, we talk about bats? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Why not? Braden's yeah. leaving us. Bye, Braden. Love you. Uh, how much time we have? Uh, well, we technically were ending at six, but we still have 61 people, including yourself and myself and Laura. Wow. Uh, on here. You so never tell me that. Now you intimidate me. Now I feel <laughs> pressure. And I'm wearing but my. Go ahead and my touch mind. on it. I think it, it, it also is part of what, um, you know, maybe Greg was leading towards and, and variety yeah. of, and a uh, Blue Weber. Blue Weber. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, this, this uh, bat friendly program uh, project is, uh, it covers, is, it was uh, created uh, precisely for the, uh, the use and abuse of uh, cloning on the um, tequila industry. Uh, for over a hundred years, the producers of tequila, uh, in order to obtain more agave and faster, they decide to eliminate the uh, the reproduction of their agaves via uh, cross pollinization, which is uh, you know the pictures, the left picture and the bottom picture, it shows the flower stalk. Uh, actually, you know, let me let me just switch uh, screens here and go to more specific pictures because I have some pretty cool pictures of the bat friendly project. Um, this is, uh, let me see, okay. This is, uh, uh, actually this picture is a picture of the uh, a agave plantation that was used for batch number one on the Siembra Valles Ancestral. Uh, I'm sorry, in batch number two, the Siembra Valles Ancestral. Uh, this is, uh, by no means, this is a picture that makes no sense on tequila industry if under normal conditions. Uh, this is an agave tequila Weber plantation owned by the Rosales family, and they allow to bloom these agaves, uh, and, uh, and these agaves, they were donated to the pilot program of Bat Friendly. And what is that program? Uh, the, the, um, uh, but, 25 years ago, I, um, I approached to the Tequila Regulatory Council of Tequila, being um, a student of uh, uh, Gary Naham, Ana Valenzuela, uh, and uh, obviously to their mentor, um, and the best book on agaves that you can possibly have, and this is in English, I strongly recommend you guys to go for this book if you wanna know about agave. It's called Agaves of Continental North America. And it's by, by the father of agave, which is uh, Scott Gentry. This guy uh, classified about 80% of the total agave species in the world. Just imagine that. So studying these guys, uh, it was part of my preparation to jump into seriously into the tequila category. Um, we figure out that uh, that uh, we were walking into a pretty much like a genocide of agaves if we continue to do this cloning reproduction. Um, so uh, I approached to the regulatory council of tequila and I told them, "Listen, guys, something has to be done. We had to keep generate some balance on the reproduction 
it will be a great idea to allow some agaves to develop their flower stalks and get the genetic strength from wild agaves to re-enhance the genetic structure of the agaves so we can help them to defend themselves from their natural predators and diseases that affect the agave plantations. And uh, fortunately, there was no reaction, no follow-ups to that. Uh, I didn't know that at the same time, Rodrigo Medellin was uh, approaching, he approached to the regulatory council of tequila, and, uh, but he approached from the bat perspective. Rodrigo Medellin is an expert of, in, in bats. Is one of the most respected authorities in the world when it comes to studies on bats. And uh, he happens to be from Mexico and part of the academic team of the National University of Mexico. And, um, you know, he approached the Regulatory Council of Tequila also, and he said, hey, guys, you better leave along my bats. You know, we need, we need to preserve the food corridors that the bats are using for millions of years because when these bats fly in this corridor that is part of the, the path of migration that they've been using for millions of years, when it comes to the tequila corridor, it's no food for them. Why? Because as, long as, as soon as the agaves start to develop uh, the flower stalk, we castrate the plants because we don't want to lose. If you see this agave, this picture that we have right now, that is a mature agave cupriata when the agaves reach maturity only once in their lives they're going to flower it's like the last effort to reproduce so they're going to give us this flower stalk in the in order for the agaves to uh, develop this flower stalk they're going to use all the sugar which translates into energy into develop these flower stalks that can reach up to 15 20 feet high those flowers that you see in the orange and reddish color, they are loaded with uh, nectar. Uh, here is one of uh, Rodrigo's students uh, extracting the nectar of this uh, specimen uh, to study the capacity to understand how much nectar this uh, quixote from this tequilana weber is generating in order for, to, for us to understand how many quixotes we need to sustain a population of bats that are flying across these plantations. It's a fascinating project that is aiming to bring back uh, the food source for, agave, for, for bats, but also to bring back the reward that we obtain from the bats when we bring them food they bring genetic strength. You know, a bat is a little mammal that it can fly up to 100 kilometers per night, pollinating. The, the level of efficiency that these uh, pollinators have is insane. Uh, there is no other pollinator in the world that it has such an incredible reach of uh, uh, for pollination. Look at this. This is one of my favorite pictures. I'm very proud of this picture because it's not just it was a very difficult shot, but you can see the tummy at the abdomen of the and the face of this bat totally covered with pollen. So this guy in uh, feeding himself of agaves in the Sierra Madre, this specific picture was taken in Emilio Vieira's plantation of Cupriata. And he's disseminating and, and sharing pollen from these wild, beautiful agaves into the semi-cultivated uh, Cupriatas. So here we have genetic information that is being developed through millions of years and teach the plants and tell the plants how to generate methods of defense systems of defense against plagues, you know, uh, 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 diseases that due to the lack of this cross-pollinization, especially in Agave Tequilana Weber, now we have uh, very weak agaves 
that they forget how to defend themselves from their natural predators. So the only way that we can defend the agave plantations is by allow, by using and abusing pesticides and herbicides. That is, uh, we know that that will have no happy ending, that, that um, uh, methods of reproduction. So Rodrigo and uh, the entire um, group of, uh, uh, of the board of directors of the Bad Friendly Project, we really want to develop uh, uh, and to incentivate producers and to go back and allow a small percentage of their agaves to develop flower stocks, could, um, allow cross-pollinization, collect the seeds they done through cross-pollinization, replant them, and then start to bring back that generic strength that the gap is needed. Um, we have a very high level of success with the few producers that were involved in the pilot program. Unfortunately, the agave prices, the agave crisis hit us in the middle of develop of this uh, bat friendly project and it make almost impossible for producers to allocate agaves due to the cost that that represent to the bat friendly project. But uh, I'm, um, I'm very optimistic that uh, one of the positive things that it came out of this craziness that we have, the uh, slow down of the consumption of spirits on the world, including obviously agave spirits, is going to uh, generate a high inventories on agave. You know, agave is a commodity and agave is, keeps uh, maturing. It's, uh, the agaves keep develop and keep growing. So if we don't use those agaves, they are already ready to mature, to, to be harvested it's going to start to have an impact on the price. So hopefully the price of agave start to drop and producers interested to participate on the bad friendly project are gonna be able to allocate without sacrificing, economically speaking, uh, a big chunk of money. Just, just uh, 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 one interesting data. Uh, I take the numbers from the, uh, the 2019 agave used for production of tequila, uh, which are pretty accurate. They're generated by the Regulatory Council of Tequila. Last year, during the months of January, February, March, and April, we used 440,000 tons of agave. We harvest that much agave on three, the first uh, four months of the year last year. That equals about 12, uh, 12 uh, point five million agave plants. That quantity taking an average of five kilo, you know, taken or given by the uh, uh, traditional production and diffuser production, I, I, I um, uh, use the five kilo to average the consumption of agave, but that is about two, and a half million liters of tequila is not being produced or is not gonna be, you know, because the distilleries are right now for obvious reasons, they slow down. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that the price of agave, they're gonna start to drop to levels where uh, we can start to allow bats to benefit from, you know, the, the, uh, the nectar that the, tequila, the agave is produced for them, yeah. David, do you want to share the, the, the cultural aspects of, of the agave we talked about yesterday about how it's that time of the, like, people will harvest the quijotes oh. during certain times of year? Yeah. Well, you know, the agave... I just, I just think it's very interesting because of the, how, cool. no, how, it's cool. just, it's how agave cool. just plays a, a part in the cultural life in Mexico. Yeah. It, it isn't just a revolving around alcohol. It revolves around many other things. I think Pedro it, talks it, about it a lot too. It's a very interesting topic. Yeah, thank you for reminding me that one uh, because you know, in the uh, uh, on the Valles region, uh, due to the weather and the seasons, the quiotes of agave tequilana Weber they have the tendency to mature uh, between to start to develop 
you know, the quiotes, the flower stalk that start to grow out of the heart of the piñas uh, around now in late March, all the way to June, July. Uh, that's the period of uh, sexual reproduction. You know, that's when the quiotes develop. But because nobody used them, you know, for a uh, hundred years is three generations of people. They always see that uh, agave quiotes uh, go to waste or they do in a favor to the producers if they take those quiotes out of the plants. So it became a very popular uh, dish uh, for the Bages region. You know, people allow the quiotes to develop only for about a meter, meter and a half, and, uh, and they cut them. So they do a favor to the tequileros, you know, they think that way. And they cook those quiotes. They are used for dishes. They are very popular. If you go to Arenal, Amatitan, and Tequila, which are the main centers of production of uh, areas of production of uh, agave and tequila, uh, in the plazas, in the squares, uh, you will see people selling quiote, quiote, cook quiotes. So. You know, we, Chava Rosales, uh, we're very, very excited. Uh, about three weeks, two weeks ago, he sent me these pictures of quiotes and, you know, he's going to allow these quiotes for, uh, for the bats to, to use them to, to feed the bats. And um, he, he shared these pictures and we both were almost in tears, you know, cheering for this new generation, this year's agaves. Um, which is a lot of agaves, and we think it's due to the uh, a lot of rain that we have last year. And uh, you know, uh, we were talking about to uh, allocate those quiotes for the team of Rodrigo to study them for bad friendly. And next day, he called me. He was devastated. Within the, he he was just so sad because apparently a lot of people in Arenal do a favor to them to take the quiotes away and cook them, you know? So they, they, they castrate uh, a lot of the quiotes. They were in one of the plantations of the Rosales, which is very, have a very easy access. It's a, a very close to a road. So people just look at the quiotes, eh, they cut them and they bring them and cook them and they're gonna sell them to the plaza, you know? So it is a cultural thing. So. Now Chava is uh, putting signs in the plantations that please stay away, stay out and respect these quiotes, you know. So uh, th there is not many people on the tequila culture are really uh, understand the relevance of the uh, sexual reproduction via cross-pollinization. I remember when we introduced to the, the Bat Friendly Project to a, a, a Agavero, from the Highlands region. And um, this is one of the bigger uh, agave producers uh, to, to supply a lot of distilleries in the Highlands region with agave. And uh, we sit with him and we explain to him the role of the bats in, he, in the agave. He just can't believe. He thought that we were lying to him. It's like, you know, bats and my agaves, there is no, nothing, that he was relating, you know, his, uh, the role of the bats and the, the pollinators to his agaves, you know, and this is because on the highlands region, this is very interesting, um, in the Valles region, there was some reproduction through cross-pollinization centuries ago. But uh, the agave tequilana Weber, we have to remember that it's not endemic from the highlands. The agave tequilana Weber was introduced to the highlands only about 120 years ago, which in tequila years is yesterday. Um, so, you know, they were never, uh, they never reproduced agaves via cross-pollinization. They were brought to the highlands as uh, offshoots, as hijuelos, and they start this now very prolific uh, business of, of agave growing, but only via offshoots, via ejuelos. So, you know, there is a lot to learn from uh, people related to the agave growing, to the farming, and to start to take in consideration the relevance 
of these uh, nocturnal pollinators. But you have to remember that the agaves only are sexually active, the pollen of the plants during nighttime because the metabolism of the agaves is only active during nighttime. You know, when you see uh, these uh, beautiful agaves uh, around California or Texas or, you know, uh, these agaves during daytime are sleeping. The, the activity on the agaves, uh, it, you know, the metabolisms get activated at nighttime. So who flies at nighttime? Bats. So they are the only, you know, uh, successful and highly efficient pollinators for these incredible plants. Look at this ecosystem. This is a, this is a ranch owned by Emilio Vieira who produced Don Mateo de la Sierra that you guys have in the portfolio. Uh, Emilio is one of the, uh, also a future, talking about future tradition, uh, a young maestro mezcalero who has, who carries over his shoulders six generations of mezcal production. And besides having a very good hand to produce mezcal, he's also very ecosystem driven person. This ranch of a limon, if you notice, is not like a, a blue desert, which is uh, one of the uh, uh, academics that we work with, uh, calls the agave tequilana weber plantations. Because if you see the agave tequilana weber plantations, it's like nothing but blue agaves. Here is a lot of cupriata agave, but also the natural elements of this ecosystem are there. Trees, flowers, grass, everything is respected. This is as environmental friendly uh, uh, agave plantation as it can be. Yeah. Let me see what else we have. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, I've been talking too much. No questions, I'm sorry. Anything else guys? Um, you guys couldn't see it in the photo, but uh, at that ranch, there's agaves growing. You're up at what, 6,000, 7,000 feet? Yeah, about almost 7,000 feet. And, and there's agaves just growing wildly down the hills of, of, of that, of all those, all those, well, you're in the mountains essentially. And it's also a hour and a half drive on a dirt rock road and in the back of a pickup truck standing to get there. Um, it's a it's a really really beautiful place. What's the other agave growing in the middle, kind of of the photo, and then kind of to the left? Do you see uh, Emilio called it uh, Emilio called that agave padincillo. Uh, mm, okay. Yeah. And then but, the other big ones in the front are the cupriatas, and that's mostly cupriatas. what's growing there. But let me let me just make a, a, a couple observations on this on this picture. Uh, uh, if you notice, there is uh, quite a few uh, quiotes to develop, you know, they are untouched. What Emilio does uh, is to uh, select the healthiest agaves that are in, the, in this ranch. And he used those agaves as, uh, to uh, reproduce new, a new generation of agaves. Uh, the agave cupriata, one of the, one of the uh, interesting characteristics of the agave cupriata is that these agaves only reproduce via cross-pollinization. These agaves don't give us offshoots. Uh, so the only way that this specific agave can reproduce is by collecting the seeds, and those seeds, they are planted on a, on, on, on a um, nursery, allow that agave to develop for about a year, year and a half, and then come and re replant it. If you see it on the bottom, on the center part of this picture, it's a little baby agave. That's not an offshoot. That is a new agave that it was brought by Emilio's team into the uh, plantation. So it was taken from the nursery back into the uh, Rancho Limon. But uh, you know, the, uh, the agave cupriata is a very successful uh, agave when it comes to give us uh, seeds. A cupriata, uh, one quiote or cupriata can give us up to 80,000 seeds per plant. 
you know, because remember, this agave only reproduced via cross-pollinization. To the contrary of the agave tequilana Weber that is very efficient through the cloning reproduction, we are lucky we're gonna get only about eight to 10,000 seeds from a, from a agave tequilana Weber. You know, it's very interesting how these plants are, you know, develop their strategics of, of surviving and, and reproducing. Yeah. So this is a beautiful picture of Emilio's ranch. Yeah. Um, this is a, another great picture that shows also the, the uh, diversity of the, uh, of the agaves, you know, that he has. He has this cupriata that is fully mature. And uh, after, after uh, this plant finished with his uh, seeding process, uh, it pretty much died. You know, it dries out, and uh, he, but he give us 80,000 seeds that uh, Emilio and his people uh, carefully select and, and, and replant it. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the cupriata explodes into more colors than other agaves possibly when they reach they're the gorgeous. end of their life cycle. It's crazy. They're, they're just a gorgeous specimens. Yeah, uh, the cupriatas and the inakidens, they're also growing in Michoacan. They are uh, an incredible specimens. They are very, you know, they just, not just very resistant and, 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 and very, uh, you know, good when it comes to reproduction and, and survival. But uh, they are also gorgeous. They are the, physically speaking, they are pencas. They are these very wide pencas. Uh, Cupriata uh, get its name from the the um, thorns, the tea on the penca. That is a, a copperish call. Cupriata. It comes from the copper. Cupriata. So the reddish copperish call color on the uh, on the teeth of the pencas. It make them and the and the deep green colors. It made this you know beautiful contrast of colors on the uh, on this uh, species of agave. Yeah. Um, let's see. Are there? Uh, let's see. Maybe a couple other questions, and then we should uh, move on and let you have your evening, David. Uh, Raul says it's estimated that two million tons of acidic agave waste pulp or the bagasse is generated a year. Do we know what is done with all that waste? I'm oh, wondering oh. if that's just in, in tequila production or if that's all of... Oh, uh, he's he's talking about the, uh, he's talking about the fibers or the... The leftover, uh, yeah, the leftover pulp that's generated from, from the production process, yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously not? it gets reused in, 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 smaller palenques or, or, you know, but I'm not well, sure about industrial producers and what they do with- You know, the arrival, of the arrival of the, uh, of the synthetic uh, materials, it pretty much eliminate the, uh, the, the use of the fiber of the agave. Remember the agaves are, are very fibrous. Um, uh, the leaves are very fibrous. They were for, for centuries, actually for thousands of years, they were incredibly uh, related to the everyday life of Mesoamerican people. They were using for, you know, textiles. They were making clothes, paper, uh, construction materials. There were multiple uses of the uh, of the fibers that we found on the uh, on the agaves. But uh, you know, with the industrialization and the arrival of many many different materials. Yeah, and probably the most common was textile, the synthetic fibers. The use of the fibers of agave were pretty much pushed aside. Uh, you know, the, the most, uh, probably the most uh, important uh, case of the lack of use of the fibers of agave is uh, from the Yucatan Peninsula, where we have the agave eneken, which is a uh, at one point during the colonial times, Merida one of the, it was one of the wealthiest per capita cities on the New World. 
due to the use of the fibers of agave, of the eneken. And um, as you can imagine, when, when the synthetic fibers became available to the world, uh, it became into such a you know, recession and economical uh, challenge for that city because it was highly dependent on the textile industry. But uh, no, unfortunately, it's not much use of the waste of the bagasse in, the, in, in, in today's um, world. Yeah. Unmute. Or, um, there's another question. Um, great question. Um, are there currently any programs in place to pay humidors a fair working wage to help ensure their future? Great question. Because as we look in at this Romero member of the family, um, the Jimador is being always um, marginalized. Yeah, you know, uh, I have a very close relationship with the Jimadores that I work with. And um, uh, unfortunately, uh, even if we had the best intentions and to, we really are committed and we work with the Jimador family that uh, is uh, involved in tequila and siembra production. Uh, I mean, probably Gina will tell you more about it, but we have programs and uh, we have a schooling and, you know, we help them in any, every possible way that we can to the Jimadores and their families. But uh, this is an issue that it has to be observed and take by the industry in general, mm -hmm. because uh, we cannot have just one producer uh, or paying better to the their Jimadores when you have the entire industry who are not paying fair wages to them. Uh, because you know the price of the labor is involved on the cost of production. So when you have a small producers who are outsourcing the labor of the Jimadores, if they're gonna pay more, it put them in a tremendous disadvantage on their cost of the final product. And when you have a big industry who is using uh, intermediaries, we call coyotes, you know, the coyotes who are intermediaries to source agave for big producers, these intermediaries basically do the dirty job for the big guys. Some of the big guys, yes, they mentioned that they have uh, teams of jimadores and they have all the benefits that uh, any you know, employee in the distillery has. And I salute that and that's wonderful. But unfortunately, that's the very, very small percentage of jimadores. Uh, most of the jimadores, they are in, uh, uh, they are at sore contracting, and they are at the mercy of intermediaries who pay, you know, whatever they want to pay them. And uh, a jimador, even if he's one of the most, uh, you know, important members on the tequila production, is still way underpaid. Uh, this is something that uh, when we talk about transparency and traceability, it has to be uh, used. It has to be incorporate that uh, the Jimador aspect into the conversation of sustainability and transparency. What we do in our label, if you notice, if you read the back of the label where the technical data is, we mention the lead Jimador that we work with all the time. And we work not just in going there and take a beautiful pictures of them working. We also get involved with uh, as much as we can with their uh, everyday life and, and the, uh, you know, and their families. So it, it's a very interesting topic that uh, nowadays it, it, more than ever is needed to be bringing to the attention because, you know, with all these uh, migration uh, slash politics, don't get me there, please, Gino, take me out of that conversation. But uh, we see a lot of migration uh, from Mexico, uh, but due to the lack of access to United States because the militarization of the border by Mexican soldiers, 
and the very harsh conditions in the American side, a lot of these Himadores, they are, for economical reasons, they are pushed out of their communities because they cannot make the everyday living by the uh, amount of money they get paid by uh, the HEMA. Because you have to remember, it's a temporary job. You don't have like a uh, five days or six days a week guarantee and eight hours. You know, sometimes you do a lot of a lot of harvest. Sometimes you don't do much in months. So uh, it is a topic that uh, it should be taken in consideration. Yeah, I mean, there's so much there's so much about mezcal and and agave spirits that touches on the the modern idea of what work is and what our our modern society is and and touches back to a time that that work wasn't considered what it is today specialization eight hour days etc it was a more worldly thing and i think there's so much to investigate there but i i also think we've done this for two hours now and and sorry. We can we can leave it. No, there's no sorry. Everybody's psyched. It, it's uh, it's that we can do another one of these multiple times over and focus in on different areas of all the great things that you do. So, I just want to say, you know, on behalf of everyone, we appreciate your dedication to this, uh, to 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 bringing all all this attention towards things that are just you know, no one's talking about and no one's not, not, I shouldn't say no one, many people are not sharing this type of information. And there are a lot that are, and there are a lot of great people that are on the same page that you're on. And, and we just keep going forward. And I encourage everyone that's on here to talk to your friends, to push them towards drinking spirits that are transparent and sustainable and looking at the products that, that, that David imports and these producers he works with, he doesn't just import them. This is a direct relationship, as you can tell, uh, that David shares with all these people and, and a shared respect amongst all of them together and trust. So just talk to your friends, show them what real tequila can taste like, show them what real mezcal can taste like, uh, and why it costs more and where their money is going. Just ten dollars twenty dollars more sometimes on a bottle is is, is supporting something uh massively so yeah thank you so much david yeah, we really appreciate it and we'll set up another one for the future you cannot you cannot rid of me without me saying <laughs> without me saying that uh you know all what we do in in in, in mexico and 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 in the importing aspect uh it will not be possible if we don't have such a Commit, committed team uh, and passionate uh, about uh, agave spirits. I mean, the, the, the respect that I have for the level that uh, people like, uh, you know, you guys, uh, you know, Monique, uh, Mega, and I see Dan, Siren, and uh, Matt, and you guys are uh, the reason that I keep going because the, 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 the level of commitment and, and, and the way that you give yourselves into such a competitive and not fair competitive uh, market that you deal every, every day is just incredible. I mean, uh, for you guys to keep doing and supporting the way you're supporting us is the best, best, best incentive that we have. And I think I can speak on behalf of the producers, you know, they are, they have incredible admiration and respect for the work that you do in the trenches every day. So thank you for what you're doing, guys. Yeah. And talk to your, when the bars reopen, talk to the bartenders, talk to everyone. Talk to the bartenders and don't, you know, something that I always say is, it's really common for people to ask for better pricing. Can you give me a better price? If I put this in a cocktail, can you give me a better price? And the answer, is no you know like because every time we try to give somebody a better price that's not that's cutting into the hemidors and the producers and that's that's bringing the entire the whole economic system for tequila and agave and mezcal down so 
don't ask for a better price. Like pay what it's worth, which is probably even more than what you're paying. So Nick, Nick. greed greed is a very bad counselor. Yeah. Yes. All right, David. Thank you so much. Everybody have thank a great you. weekend. We'll do it thank again. Everybody. I, I promise. Um, and, and thank we'll, you for uh, everybody. Wow, it's 110 people. We were at like 80 something at one point. Mm -hmm. Uh, and now 85. Now we're at now, I see 111 people. Wow. Cool. Cool. Well, thank well, you guys. So folks, yes, David. So, as you log out, you're going to see a survey. If you could take some time and fill it out, that would be incredibly helpful. You'll also get a link to it tomorrow, as well as information about other um, seminars. I don't know what to call these that are coming up. Um, but thank you so much for tuning in, David. Thank you so much, Gino. Thank you. Um, yeah, enjoy your weekend, whatever that means. Bye, guys. Bye. Ready? End meeting. Back.